Okay, this is Brian and I'm going to go through some uh, more specifics about what you can do with uh, the quantitative one sample uh, uh, statistics um, for, um, for uh, numerical data. So, so quantitative numerical data, one single sample, uh, and uh, just the different features that this page has. So, so first on this video, we're just going to look at the, the descriptive statistics, which are um, the numbers you can get from the data, which is the statistics, as well as the different charts and um, kind of what they tell you. So, um, so using the site is pretty simple as in far as like just if you paste, if you, I already have data there, but I if I have uh, data, I paste it in. My data is separated by commas. Um, if I just click calculate now, it will first immediately it will clean up the data, removing the commas. Uh, by default, it'll separate the numbers by spaces. Um, but if you separate it by semicolons or tabs or anything, it's it can handle all of those separations, and it just cleans it up and puts it in this format. Um, and let's open up the summary statistics by clicking this, and you'll see that we have first. Um, it's just the so we have the name of the statistic and the value. So the sample size is how many numbers are in the in this group of numbers. We have 25 of them. And we have a few measures of center. The, the, the mean or the sample mean, um, the abbreviation they use is X with a little line over top, the X bar. Um, the median, which there are a, a few different notations. I have used X with a tilde on top. Some books use something different. Sometimes people use a capital M. Um, the mode is usually not applicable for numerical data, but if, if it's discrete, then there might be a mode. The mode is the single number that appears most often. Uh, if there are multiple modes, each of them will be listed here, you know, separated by commas. Um, uh, but again, this is usually not applicable for, for, uh, for continuous data. For data, unless it's um, uh, something like this, there's like, it's very, very, unlikely to have the same number twice with a small sample size with very large numbers, right? Um, measures of spread, uh, oh, um, and then mid-range. This mid-range is, uh, it's taught in some book textbooks. It's kind of arc kind of obsolete, but um, it's calculated for you. It's the average of the minimum and the maximum value from your data set. Uh, measures of spread sort of talk about how, how much your data um, spreads apart from the from the middle um, or from the center the range is the difference between the maximum and the the like the largest and smallest numbers the interquartile range is the difference between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile um, which is to say like the middle the middle 50 percent of your data in this case um, you can see that look, 650 it's like Right here, it goes from 650 roughly to, um, oh, I'm sorry, the the first quartile is 410, which is like halfway between 374 and 422 uh, ish. Um, yeah, I think that is exact. No, not exact. And then um, up to the third quartile, which is at 160. So this is a th what I'm selecting here is like roughly the middle the middle 50% of the data, and so the interquartile range tells you what's the range of that subset of this data. The sample variance is honestly a little bit unnecessary for an introductory stats course because usually it doesn't have the same interpretation as the sample standard deviation, which is abbreviated with a S. Now, um, it, it gives a population standard deviation as well, which you can ignore um, typically because you'll usually have sample data and not population data. However, if you wanted to have the population standard deviation, it's calculated in a slightly different way. It's always slightly less than the sample standard deviation. And um, so it's, it's calculated for you there, but usually it's not applicable. So you would usually ignore that. Um, then other things, um, the, the minimum, the, the first quartile, the third quartile, these quartiles are percentile estimates which actually you can, you can calculate any percentile. This is the fifth percentile. You can calculate it by putting in, I can get the 16th percentile um, 
and I can get the 55th percentile or the 95th percentile. So this is, the percentile is, it's a number such that 95% of the data is less than that number, right? This is an, it's an estimate of a population percentile. Um, and then skew and kurtosis are calculated for you. You may get to those in your stats class. Skew is a measurement of how asymmetric your data is. Kurtosis is a measure of how concentrated your data is in the middle. Um, but I don't want to go too much into detail of those. You can read more about those. So you can get a lot of summary stats and then we have a bunch of charts. And all the charts sort of visualize your data in a different way. And some of them are more informative than others. The classic one is a histogram. You are able to, um, if your data is discrete, now this technically is discrete data, uh, you could argue, because they're in, it's integer data. This button or this uh, checkbox will be available if you have integer data, but it's not going to look good for this data set. It looks awful. Um, instead, you want to probably, it, by default, it uses this this uh, for the number of bins and you can change the number of bins using one of these um, rules or you can specify four bins five six seven eight nine depending on the number of bins you pick it will highlight different features of the um, of the of the shape of the distribution however if you have too few it um, four is probably the minimum you'd ever want to use uh, in fact yeah I don't think you can use more than less than four using stat powers. If you have too many, it really doesn't uh, tell you much. So you probably want to have um, something where you you start to see the shape where the bins aren't too narrow, because um, then you get a lot of these little jagged spikes, and that's not really um, that's a little. It doesn't. You want to get a big picture, but you don't want it to be too zoomed out. Okay, so I don't know. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a trial and error to pick the number of bins. Um, let's go to frequency polygon. Uh, this is a, basically a histogram, but instead of having bars, the there's a line connecting the uh, the peaks of the bars, the me middle of the peaks. Um, and um, uh, to be honest, I, I I'm not that into frequency polygons. The cumulative frequency polygon. Um, is actually kind of nice because it it gives you um, this is a way of sort of introducing you to the idea of a cumulative distribution function or, uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, so the regular frequency polygon is essentially just showing you the shape of the distribution um, the uh, but it, it kind of it links a histogram with the idea of a, um, a density plot. So, um, but anyway, frequency polygon, you can set the number of bins as well. Um, and you can give it discrete bars, just like a histogram, if it's applicable. Um, but anyway, what I was saying is cumulative, each of these like increases in the height of the bar is it's, it's, um, sorry, uh, each of the, not the increases, but the, the height of each of these points is added uh, at each step. So it always ends up at one when you get to the end. Um, that's what cumulative means. Um, but in cumulative, it's going to scale it so it's the relative frequency instead of the, the cumulative frequency. So it's, it's scaled so that it goes from zero to one rather than from zero to the, the total number of your data set. Um, I'll go over um, th the box plot first. Before, or before the violin plot. Box plot is a very classic way of d uh, visualizing data. Um, it, you've got a, um, you're dividing the data roughly into quarters. The, the lowest value, or um, which I'll put a little caveat on, but basically the lowest value is given by this down here, the highest value is up here, and then the, the 25th percentile the middle or the, the, I should say the median and then the fifth, uh, the 75th percentile. So the box is going to bound around the middle 50% of your data. And then you have your upper and lower quarter quarters. Um, the, if there are outliers, they will be highlighted as dots or they'll be indicated as dots. Um, 
and uh, that's that. Let's see, a dot plot is a way of just representing your your data values uh, individually. So you still get kind of the same shape as your um, histogram. I've chosen in the website to have a um, have a kind of a dot plot that that um, is centered like the that the dots are centered around this middle axis. There's a few different options. Um, neat will will it'll look very neat, but it's the the points are going to be kind of rounded to the nearest um, value that where they fit nicely. By row, uh, the d values are going to be exactly where they are, but you're going to get some weird shapes. So depending on how you want to um, how you want to display your data, you can choose one of those. Uh, let's see. So a density plot I was saying is is it's um, it takes the idea of the frequency polygon, but it, it uses some a little more complicated calculation to uh, estimate a smooth curve that estimates the, the, the population that you're sampling from, like what the, the shape of that population um, is. Um, and depending on the, um, you can, you can choose a couple different kernel functions. Gaussian is very typical and the bandwidth is selected for you automatically um, using a formula, but you can specify that to be different values. Um, and as you change the bandwidth, it will, the lower the bandwidth, the more spiky your density function is. So that's usually not a good thing. You want to have it usually be connected. So the automatic one is often going to be good, but it, it, it really is a case by case. You may need to adjust that. Um, the higher, if you get it too high, it's really just going to look like a, a normal distribution, which might be too much of a uh, smoothing. So you, you can play with that a little bit. Uh, let's see. And then, f then the stem and leaf plot is a personal favorite of mine. It will um, give you, this is a way of visualizing all of your data, uh, but also giving you the values. So this is, um, so this is, um, uh, we're, we're sort of losing a little bit of precision. So uh, for example, we have, um, there, we're rounding to the nearest, um, uh, the nearest hundred it looked like. So the first value is 36, which is rounded to down to zero. The next highest is 268, which is rounded up to 300. So the key is telling you how to interpret each of these. The stem is, is the um, sort of, the, the stem would be the thousandths place, and the, the number over here is the hundredths place. So zero, three means that we have a 300. Zero, three, 300. So we have 300, 300, 300, then 400, 400, 400, 500. 600, 600, 700, which is, if you take your data and round them to the nearest hundreds, then um, this is what uh, this is what you'd get. Now, and you can, it's automatically going to choose the stem size and the the number of splits uh, to make it look as good as it thinks looks good. <laughs> you can change that if you want. If I wanted the stem size to be the hundreds, and I didn't want to split it at all. Um, I'm going to get this as my stem and leaf plot. So you can you can play around with that and you can see now the key says that the the number here is the hundreds place and this is the tens place. So now it's a little bit more precise. Zero four means a forty, then one, there's nothing that starts with there's no hundreds, but there's a two hundred and seventy, roughly, three hundred and ten, three hundred and forty, three hundred and sixty, three hundred and seventy, and so forth. Okay. So lastly I want to just talk about this violin plot, which is a way of combining a density plot and other plots into one thing. So a, a violin plot really is just, you take that density plot and you reflect it. So you make sort of this, um, this blobby thing. And uh, it, it, depending on whether you have it vertically or horizontally, it, it looks like different stuff. Um, now, uh, I chosen to have them go horizontally rather than vertically, just to stay with having the axis horizontal across the website. Um, just keeps it simple. So you can choose whether to have another plot on the interior. 
a um, the box plot, so the exact same thing that you'd have in the box plot, except it doesn't have lines for the whiskers, is going to be printed uh, in the middle. So you can have you can combine the density plot with the um, with the box plot. You can also put a, the the mean and the, and one standard deviation in there as well. Uh, and then also you can have your data as a dot plot in there. So if you wanted to see how the data relates to the this destiny plot estimation, this is a nice way of visualizing that. Depending if you have a ton of data, the dots are going to be smaller, and in it is possible that they may escape from the the shape. But um, I tried to limit the possibility of that happening. But it certainly you could you could make that happen if you played played with it enough. So um, those are the plots, and that's the summary statistics, and uh, that's it for this video for the summary, uh, this descriptive statistics for uh, a single sample of quantitative data.